It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Australia's eighth chief scientist and engineer, neuroscientist, successful entrepreneur and philanthropist, Dr Alan Finkel. Please make him feel welcome. Uh, thank you, Jessica and Erin, and thank you, Uncle Lewis, for your uh, extraordinary uh, introduction. I learned so much in a way that I would not normally learn about the uh, language skills of the Ghana people and the observational science skills. It was terrific to hear that, and I do also acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the uh, for which the Ghana people have been traditional owners, and I acknowledge I guess, your ancestors, past and present. So I want to start with a question that's impossible to answer. Who invented citizen science? And it depends on who you ask. The bird watchers say that it began with the Audubon Society and the great Christmas bird count, 1900. The weather watchers say that it began with Thomas Jefferson. That's right, the US president, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, extraordinary person. So they say that in 70, 1776 he went to Philadelphia to sign the American Declaration of Independence. Then he popped into the hardware store and he picked up a barometer to take home. He thought that it would be, that it would be fun if he and the founding fathers, his mates across the country, made weather observations and shared their notes. That was the birth of the National Weather Service. And of course, it exists to this day. Now, if you ask the historians, well, they will say that all science used to be citizen science. It was professional science that had to be invented. And as chief scientist, I have to be neutral. So I refuse to tell you who was first. But I do know that Australia has played an important role. We have a long history of great citizen science and we ought to hear more about it. And I want to tell you about one of our earliest stories and a story that began right here in Adelaide. So we're back in the year 1847. There was a man named Ferdinand Mueller. He was born in Germany but he had come to Adelaide and he had come with a dream. He wanted to be a botanist, not just any botanist, he wanted to be the best and boldest botanist in the world. And so he decided that he would collect specimens of every plant in Australia. Every plant in Australia. It's big. So off he went marching on expeditions all around South Australia and he went from Queensland to Victoria. He went up mountains and he went across deserts and he did this for the better part of a decade. And he demonstrated beyond any doubt that Australia was very large and had lots of plants. <laughs> but, then, but then inspiration dawned. He realised that the way to collect plants wasn't to walk around collecting plants, but to sit very comfortably in Melbourne collecting collectors. And that's what he did. He put advertisements in the newspapers calling for volunteers. And he set up a network of amateur collectors, that is, citizen scientists, all over the continent. And over the next 40 years, more than 1,300 people contributed to Ferdinand Mueller's research. And that includes more than 200 women and 20 young girls. The youngest was just six, six years old when she collected her first plant. One of the women was named Mary Kennedy, and it's interesting to try to imagine her life. She lived on a sheep station in Wilcannia on the Darling River in New South Wales. And that was about as far inland as you could go without falling off the map. She was the mother of 11 children. And she collected more than 500 plant specimens for Ferdinand Mueller. 
Now, Mrs Kennedy, she didn't just collect the seeds and the flowers. She asked the local indigenous people for the names of these plants and the uses of these plants. So she left a legacy not just for botanists, but for everyone who cherishes our indigenous heritage. And Ferdinand Mueller, he gave her a legacy in exchange. He named a species of Grevillea in her honour. It's Grevillea kennediana. Now, in those days, they hadn't invented the term. No one called it citizen science. But in hindsight, of course, that's exactly what it was. And it checks off the big three criteria that I personally think are important for any great citizen science endeavour. So number one, it has to be good science. It's not about tripping through the fields collecting flowers. Ferdinand Mueller stressed that point time and time again. He was a world famous botanist. And yes, he said that all the time too. <laughs> but it was true and he was proud of it. And he wasn't about to put up shoddy work for the learned academics in London, and Paris and Hamburg and Boston, shoddy work for them to rip apart. He needed good data. So he told his collectors, he shared with them the scientific goal. He explained how their contribution would assist him. And to ensure that they did it properly, he sent out envelopes suitable for collecting the samples, along with a little book of instructions with helpful diagrams. So when a woman on a sheep station picked up her basket and headed off into the scrub, she did so in the name of science. Of course, she enjoyed the outing, but it was a package deal. It was fun and science. And when she put samples on the mantelpiece to dry, that was science. When she carefully packaged them as per the instructions in the envelope with details of the date and the place of collection, that was science. So number one, citizen science has to be good science, consistent with the rigorous standards we, we apply to every other experimental process. Second rule. Citizen science has to be a door to the world of science. Now, Ferdinand Mueller, he actually wasn't all that interested in social policy. He was an opportunist, plain and simple. He recruited kids because they were happy and they were enthusiastic about going out and wading through the mud. He recruited women because he could see their talent going to waste. In colonial times, they couldn't go to university. They couldn't enter the professions. But his project offered a glimpse of the world that they longed to enter, a world where, in a different time, they would undoubtedly have thrived. And they proved that they were worthy of far more, full and equal access with men on merit. And times have changed, of course, very much for the better. Thanks in large, in large part to those female pioneers. But we still need those doors to science in the community. We, mean, we need to make those doors so bright, so bold, and so compelling that everybody wants to walk through. And everyone who, who enters feels a magnetic attraction to stay. So even if they give up science in high school, maybe especially if they give up science in high school. The future belongs to all of us. The science that will shape it ought to be shared as well. So that's number two. Citizen science has to be a door to the world of science. Number three. Citizen science has to make the world a better place. Because in the end, that's what makes it worth doing. It's all there in the letters that were written to Mueller more than 150 years ago. Time and time again, these farmers' wives and stockmen's daughters speak of their pride in doing something 
for Australia. And you have to remember the context in the 1800s. It was the era of Banjo Patterson and Henry Lawson. We were falling in love with our country. There's even talk of federation in the newspapers. And now here's a project that unites men and women from every colony with a mighty vision and a love of country. We often focus on the science part of the phrase citizen science, but the citizen is important as well because it reminds us that we are part of something much greater than ourselves. And I think it spurs us to be part of making something better for the generations to come. So there are my three criteria of citizen science. First, it has to be good science. Second, it has to be a door to the world of science. And third, it has to make the world a better place. And a project that ticks all three boxes will inspire talented people to succeed. Now, if we could go back in time to 1847 and pick up Ferdinand Mueller and drop him right here in this conference, of course he would collapse in shock. But a capable guy, he'd get over it. <laughs> and then he would ask the question at the heart of this conference, what's next for citizen science? In the 21st century, what role will it play in the human quest for knowledge? What place will it take in people's lives? Answering those questions, you can imagine two possible scenarios. And the first scenario is that citizen science will be left, left behind in the 20th century. Robots and artificial intelligence will do more and more of the tasks that in the past could only be done by large numbers of humans. For example, examining the images from space telescopes. NASA is already using neural networks to trawl through a database of images from 150,000 stars. And that neural network software is aiming to catch the minuscule change in brightness that signals the presence of a planet. Automated systems have been used before, but it's machine learning that's changing the game. It's a big transition we're going through. And now, in that can you analyse the image game, it's the machines who are winning. And in the same way, some people will tell you all citizen scientists will be made redundant. And then all scientists, and then perhaps all humans. Citizen science in that scenario will be something we do for fun, but not something we do because it makes a meaningful contribution. So that's scenario number one. The second scenario accepts that technology is changing. And so citizen science is changing as well. But it's changing for the better. It's surging in the slipstream of technology instead of falling behind. On this reading, citizen science has never been more important or alive. Now that's the position of The Economist magazine. And say what you like about The Economist magazine, it's not known for sentimentality. It's hardcore, down the centre, economic rationalism. And the Economist magazine, they call the current moment in citizen science, they call that punk science, which is brilliant technology combined with resourceful humans. At one end of the spectrum, you have tools that used to be long in high-end laboratories, such as fluorescence microscopes costing tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. But now, with a 3D printer that you might pick up at Aldi and downloadable plans from the University of Sussex, you can make a fluorescence microscope to occupy pride of place in your home for less than $500. And you can order a gene editing kit online for a few hundred dollars. You, the citizen, can do so much more thanks to technology. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, people are still pretty good at knocking up 
really low-tech tools that do a lot. There's a project in Canada, and I read about this in The Economist magazine, on monitoring small plastic debris on the surface of the water. It's a big problem, fish ingested. Now, when scientists monitor and collect this plastic debris, they have to collect it and they use special nets that float behind the boats and cost $5,000 each. In the citizen science version, it's done with $10 toddler tights. You grab a plastic bottle, cut it in half, use that as the mouth, you slip over the tights, you attach it to a boat, and there you go. You've got a do-it-yourself skimmer. $10 instead of 5000 but now, scientists and citizens, they're sharing these ideas. In the way that foodies tend to share pictures of smashed avocados on Instagram. <laughs> and it's a revolution that's got its own name. It's being dubbed open source hardware. And that's by analogy with the open source software revolution that has dominated amateur and professional software development for the last 20 years. So there you have it, a good idea going so much further thanks to imagination and technology combined. Personally, I find scenario two much more compelling. But here's the thing, it takes work. It takes vision, it takes creativity, it takes strategy. And it takes leadership. And I've got to acknowledge that it's the leadership such as provided by Aaron Roger, the Chairman and Chief Everything Officer of Citizen Science, uh, Jeff Garrett, the Patron of Australian Citizen Science, Graeme Durant, the CEO of Questacon, leadership for Australian Citizen Science, working with the Citizen Scientists of Australia. And above all, it needs you, it needs the Citizen Scientists. And everything that I know about being human tells me that the golden age of citizen science is still ahead. And I reckon we've come to Adelaide today because we all agree. 170 years ago, a man named Ferdinand Mueller, he came to Adelaide with a dream. And our mission today is to continue to live that dream. Thank you.